Hi everyone, and welcome to our week two video lecture. I share the slide in almost all of my classes. Many of you will see it again this fall when we take underpinnings. It's a warning about the amount of readings that you're expected to do on a weekly basis. You'll be taking multiple classes at once, plus hopefully doing your own research, altogether amounting to a few hundred pages of reading a week. The only way to do this is to digest as much literature as possible. Take this digestion metaphor to heart and appreciate the difference between nibbling on a snack versus eating a meal versus devouring a feast. This means that you'll need to learn the art of skimming. So rather than devour at once a whole book or article, so to speak, you should instead start by nibbling at it, getting the substance, what you need for now, and moving on. When you read a book for pleasure, you most often read linearly, starting at the beginning and working your way through the book page by page. This is not necessarily the best strategy for academic reading. Your job is to read strategically, mining the text that you are reading for information. You need to dive in, find what you need, and move on to the next. Sometimes that means just reading specific chapters. Additionally, within the body chapters, you may just need to read certain sections. Make use of the headers and subheaders, or the section breaks that provide signposts or way markers to help you navigate. Additionally, the index can help you pinpoint exactly what you need. Adjust the speed of your reading in accordance with the nature and content of the material. You don't need to remember everything after your first reading. Total recall is impossible. And if you don't comprehend the first time or lose concentration, you don't have to immediately reread. You can always go back for a second go around later on. Just don't lose your flow for now. And like we said last week about getting into the daily writing habit, set aside a block of time each day to read. It's the only way to get through everything you need to while also turning the wheels for your own writing. Finally, you should be reading actively, not passively. That means engaging directly with the text, asking key questions. What's the author's argument? What types of evidence and sources do they use? What are the implications of their reasoning? What's their point of view? Do they have any conflicts of interest? What assumptions, predispositions, and biases are they working from? It's also crucial that you put your readings into historiographical context. How does the reading fit into an analytical lineage? What other works are related to it? Think of your work like an archeologist, digging beneath the surface level of the text and uncovering the discursive structure hidden below. A key hint to active reading is writing while you read, underlining key passages, and making short annotations in the margins. You don't necessarily have to do this on the actual book pages, but you should be writing somewhere else either in a notebook or word processor or something like that. Either way, this is the key principle. Writing while you read improves retention. Okay, so let's switch gears a bit and start thinking about the research process, which begins with a topic. A topic is just a point of departure. Etymologically, that's what the word means. It's a starting point. As a finished product, a dissertation is much, much more than a topic. But as a process, this is where your dissertation starts, with your intellectual interests and curiosities. As you develop your topic, however, you'll need to identify a research program or a larger body of scholarship that your work's going to fit into. For example, the functionalist literature and Holocaust historiography is an example of a research program, as is the colonial genocide studies literature, the latter of which is my own home base or family. And that's really what it is. For your dissertation, you'll situate yourself in a larger family of scholarship. The scholarly organizations you see here are like extended families or clans of diverse research programs that are broadly related to one another. I encourage you to follow these organizations online, see who's in them and what they're publishing. Look at their conference proceedings and calls for papers. These are hints for finding current hot topics. Okay, so a dissertation is more than a topic, but part of a larger research program. In other words, a dissertation is the product of building your own personal research agenda that focuses on a specific topic within a larger research program. Now, I don't want to overstate this terminological distinction between a research program, which is more big picture, and your own personal research agenda, which is specific to you. But the key idea here is that you want to situate your original contribution to a larger body of knowledge. To do so, specificity is key, especially for your dissertation. Avoid the temptation of choosing a topic that's too broad. For example, you may want to focus on something like Holocaust survivors or Native American genocides. 
You could spend the rest of your intellectual career on such broad topics and still fail to master them. But you're just starting your career, and you have only about a half decade or less to complete a dissertation. So you need something more manageable, like female survivors of Auschwitz, or the Pequot War in colonial New England. Remember, you have your entire career to pursue a research agenda. A dissertation is just the start. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Once you've selected a topic, your dissertation depends on developing a good research problem. As the authors of our textbook explain, a research problem is simply something that we do not yet know or fully understand. A fully articulated research problem is crucial to identify the significance of your work. Indeed, most dissertation proposals have a section on significance, where you're tasked with answering the invariable question, so what? Why is your work important? What practical and or conceptual contributions are you making? That's why it's important to understand your research problem. And you can take a good research problem and articulate it into a question or series of questions. And this will definitely be part of your dissertation proposal, your research question. So what makes a good research question? First of all, a good research question does not have a simple yes or no answer. It should be open to debate. The answer shouldn't be presupposed. You should never start a dissertation with an answer already in tow. On the contrary, it should be something that you legitimately want to explore and solve. So how do you find good research problems and questions? You do that by mastering the literature. See how other scholars in your research program have articulated their research problems and build on them. Additionally, keep track of what sorts of questions are being asked in the literature. This is where an annotated bibliography becomes very helpful. Once you have a research question, then you're ready to make an argument. An argument, in the scholarly sense of the term, isn't a fight or negative confrontation. Of course, academics do sometimes get into heated exchanges, but in principle, a scholarly argument is not supposed to be an emotionally charged or highly opinionated competition. Rather, an argument is simply the process of reasoning with the aim of persuading others. This connotation tracks with the etymology of the word, which comes from the Latin verb to make bright or enlighten. Interesting side note, you may have noticed that the symbol for silver on the periodic table is AG, from the Latin argentum. That's the same root word for argument, and that's essentially what an argument is, a set of enlightening reasons. More specifically, an argument is your response to your stated research problem and questions. An argument is sin qua non to any scholarly product, especially a dissertation. You must have an argument, otherwise it's not a scholarly product. Okay, so what are the basic elements of an argument? The core of an argument is a claim. That's the point that's being made, what's being argued for. It's a statement claiming to truly represent something real about the world. Moreover, we have to provide reasons as to why we're asserting the truth claims that we do. We have to justify our claims. Not only that, we have to provide evidence that supports our reasons. So you see an emerging structure, which our textbook does an excellent job of illustrating in part three. But the key point here is that without any evidence, your claim might as well be nonsense upon stilts. You need all of these elements to make an argument. Claim, reason, and evidence. Without any one of these, you don't have an argument. However, to have a good argument, as opposed to just a sufficient one, you need more. The textbook has a whole chapter on acknowledgement and response. That is to say, a good argument must anticipate possible objections and alternative explanations, and preemptively address any potential countervailing arguments. This sometimes includes the use of qualifications, or concessions that have to be made within an argument that limit the extent of a claim. Finally, there's the warrant, or the general principle, that forms the bridge between the claim and the evidence it's based on. It's the logical reasoning, in other words, that connects the evidence to the claim. Oftentimes this goes without saying, but you'd better be sure to understand the connection before you make the claim. Not all arguments are made equally, of course. Here's a set of common fallacies, or forms of invalid or faulty reasoning. I'm not going to go through these one by one, and there are many others, but take a moment to get acquainted with the ones you see here. Okay, and that's pretty much it. Please note that your assignment this week is part one of the Source Analysis Project. I provided a list of PhD dissertations on Moodle, of which you'll choose one to analyze. For this week, I want you to read, at the very least, the abstract, table of contents, and the introduction, and write a brief analysis in the form of a paragraph. In your analysis, I want you to identify and analyze the dissertation's topic and research question. 
How's the question phrased? Is it something that's debatable or answerable? Next week, for part two of the assignment, you'll read more of the same dissertation and respond to another set of prompts. Additionally, please note that you have a research proposal due at the end of the semester, so you need to go ahead and get started on this. Please read the syllabus for more details and reach out to me if need be. In any case, thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.